A trial that could shake the foundation of the criminal justice system in Illinois is set to begin soon in Chicago. Seven prosecutors and police officers are accused of fabricating the evidence that sent an innocent man named Rolando Cruz to death row for the rape and murder of a 10-year-old girl. What is most disturbing about this story is that another man, a man who actually confessed to the murder, has not been prosecuted for it and may never be. For nearly 10 years, Rolando Cruz sat on death row, counting the days until his execution. But ever since Cruz and two other men were first arrested in 1983 for the rape and murder of Janine Nicarico in the Chicago suburb of Naperville, serious doubts were raised about their guilt. There was no physical evidence or eyewitness testimony linking any of them to the crime. Even one of the lead detectives assigned to the case, John Sam, was convinced they didn't do it. I told my bosses on numerous occasions that I did not believe these three men had anything whatsoever to do with this crime, that we have totally have the wrong people. We need to go out and look at someone else. And they said to you? No. No more. Don't investigate? Don't do another thing. Why? Because I was making the case look bad. If I was out looking at other people, that means we weren't too convinced that they were guilty, and once they were indicted, they didn't want that out. Rolando Cruz and the two other men, Alex Hernandez and Stephen Buckley, became crime suspects after Cruz and Hernandez told police they had information about the murder, information police said only the killers could know. Later, they said they really didn't know anything. They were just trying to collect the reward money offered in the case. But a jury found Cruz and Hernandez guilty and sentenced them to death. They appealed. And based on a legal technicality, the conviction was thrown out. They were tried again, convicted again, and sent back to death row. Rolando Cruz was given a date for his execution. I knew I didn't do anything wrong. There was no, I wasn't going to just sit there and let them execute me. I was going to do everything I could do to get out. Now enter a world-famous mystery writer who also happens to be a lawyer, Scott Turow, whose bestsellers include Presumed Innocent and Burden of Proof. Turow decided to take on a real-life murder mystery after he was convinced that, in this case, the wrong men were sent to death row. He handled the second appeal for Alex Hernandez. Can you imagine committing a murder uh, of this nature and leaving behind no physical evidence of any kind, not a fingerprint, not a hair, not a fiber, no DNA? Come on. Come on. You've written several successful novels involving murder and the criminal right. justice system. How does the plot in this case measure up? This is a very sad story. This is a really, really sad story. According to Thoreau, it started with political pressure to make an arrest. Pressure from voters in the affluent community where the murder victim lived. And the prosecutors responded to it, Thoreau says, by indicting Rolando Cruz and the two others just two weeks before a hotly contested election for the job of top prosecutor in DuPage County. That community was up in arms, uh, and they demanded, um, you know, they demanded justice. There was pressure on the police and prosecutors to bring someone... Absolutely. ...to the system, try them, convict them, put them away. Um, you're going to be an ineffective law enforcement person in their eyes if you don't come up with a perpetrator. But twice mm -hmm. a jury looked at this case. Mm -hmm. Two separate juries mm -hmm. found these guys guilty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you asking me why? That's pretty compelling evidence, isn't it? It's not compelling evidence if you don't put the case on straight. And the case that was made against Rolando Cruz was anything but straight, especially one highly incriminating piece of evidence which was used to convict Cruz. It was a statement Cruz allegedly made about a dream he had, which police said contained details of the crime that only the murderer could have known. The problem with this so-called dream statement is that Cruz said he never made it, and nobody has a record of it ever occurring. There's no police report, no tape recording, and the first time it was ever mentioned was a year and a half after he supposedly made it, and just four days before Cruz went on trial. Thomas Knight prosecuted Rolando Cruz in his first trial. 
Knight says the dream statement was just one part of the case against Rolando Cruz, and he had no reason to question its validity. You decided to present incriminating evidence against Cruz based in part on this dream statement, and yet the police who heard it never wrote it down, they never made a report about it, they never recorded it. I mean, something doesn't sound right. You know, people are not that perfect that they end up uh, writing everything down. Uh, they wrote everything else down? Well, I don't think that's probably not even true. My experience is that when the defendant confesses, the police always write that down. Um, there's, I, there's no conceivable reason that you would not make a record of an incredibly incriminating statement. Not in my experience as a lawyer. But an even more incredibly incriminating statement was made when, soon after Orlando Cruz was sent to death row after his first trial, this man, Brian Dugan, a career criminal, told authorities that he was the one who killed Janine Nicarico. Dugan confessed to the Nicarico murder after he was arrested and confessed to two other murders in neighboring counties. He was sentenced to life in prison, but the new prosecutor on the case in DuPage County, Robert Kalander, chose not to believe Brian Dugan killed Janine Nicarico. The Illinois State Police, believing that Dugan might be the real killer, assigned Detective Ed Sosowski to investigate. Sitting here today, is there any doubt in your mind as to who raped and murdered Janine Nicarico? No doubt whatsoever. And that person is? Brian Dugan. What is it that, that brings you to that conclusion? He knew information that no one else could know. He knew what type of tape was used to bind the blindfold around her eyes. He knew what type of sexual assault had taken place. And I'm, I'm giving you facts, sir, that were not public. Detective Sosowski took his evidence to the prosecutors who had already sent Cruz to death row. What did the prosecutors do with this information? They uh, resisted it. So they essentially blew it off? Yes, sir. So if they accept your information that Brian Dugan did it, then they have to admit that the people they have put in prison didn't do it. Put on death row. Didn't do it. Despite Brian Dugan's confession and the lack of any physical evidence linking Rolando Cruz to the crime, Cruz was tried a second time. He was convicted again, but a higher court threw out that guilty verdict as they did the first one, because they said the jury did not get to hear all the incriminating evidence against Brian Dugan. Still, DuPage County prosecutors decided to put Cruz on trial for a third time, even though new DNA evidence had come to light linking Brian Dugan to the Nicarico murder. Even after DNA testing proved uh, that Brian Dugan uh, was clearly involved in this crime, even though that was established, they went ahead and tried Rolando Cruz again. Um, that's frightening to me. It was in the middle of the third trial when a high-ranking police official admitted that he had lied about the evidence against Cruz that the prosecution's case collapsed. The judge immediately stopped the trial, and Rolando Cruz, after spending a decade on death row, was finally free. It's not that easy. I mean, people tell me, well, you're free now. No, free? How? Psychologically, I'm not free from it all. A year after the conviction of Rolando Cruz was finally thrown out, the legal system was turned upside down when a special grand jury took the unprecedented step of indicting the very people who had built the case against Cruz. Three prosecutors and four police officers were charged with fabricating the case, making up the evidence that had sent Cruz to death row and kept him there for 10 years. According to the indictment, a critical line had been crossed, the line between aggressive prosecution and criminal misconduct. Prosecutor Thomas Knight was arrested and charged with knowing that Cruz's dream statement was fabricated but presenting it to the jury anyway. And Prosecutor Robert Kalander was arrested and charged with obstruction of justice for concealing the details of Brian Dugan's confession, which could have freed Cruz from death row years earlier. I think the main charge should be conspiracy to commit murder, because that's what they did. They conspired when they made that up to commit a murder to have me execute for something I didn't do.
What troubles many people about this case is that even before Brian Dugan confessed to the Nicarico murder, there was evidence that could have led police to Dugan before he went on to rape and murder two other people, an eight-year-old girl named Melissa Ackerman and 27-year-old nurse Donna Schnorr. Immediately after the Janine Nicarico murder, two eyewitnesses told police they saw a fair-skinned man between the ages of 25 and 30 driving away from the murder scene in an old green car with a missing hubcap. That description fit Brian Dugan and the car that he owned. But prosecutors became totally convinced that Rolando Cruz was the killer and dropped that promising lead. Thomas Breen is Rolando Cruz's lawyer. How would you describe the quality of the, the police work in the, the Carrico case? Real policemen follow real leads, and they uh, inventory real evidence. They do real investigations. This was a joke. Rolando Cruz is on death row, convicted in the 1983 rape and murder of 10-year-old Janine Nicarico. Like almost everyone else on death row, he says the police got the wrong man. That's not surprising. What is surprising, however, is that throughout the 10-year history of this case, some of the people you would think would most want to keep him on death row, detectives, a police chief, and even one of the prosecutors also think they got the wrong man. Next week, the Illinois State Supreme Court could say who's right. In the state of Illinois, they called death row the condemned unit. But after nearly seven years, Rolando Cruz refuses to see himself as one of the condemned. It's not easy to constantly be positive, constantly have faith. It's hard, but you have to. On February 25, 1983, Janine Nicarico was home from school with a sore throat. At noon, her mother came from the office to make her lunch. Then about 3, 3 or 3.15, got the call from a neighbor that um, my other daughter had come home and found the door had been broken into, the house had been broken into, and Janine was gone. Police found nothing missing from the house except Janine and a blanket. Tom Knight was the first Rolando prosecutor in the case and oversaw the police investigation. So you think it was a burglary that went bad, spiraled downhill? Correct. It's a burglary with the, that they found the, found the girl and just took her instead, and it was more like a, probably like a pack of dogs. Janine's body was found two days later in the overgrown brush beside a hiking trail. The police investigated for more than a year before making arrests. Despite three eyewitnesses seeing a lone white male, two Hispanics are now in prison for the crime, Rolando Cruz and Alex Hernandez. How did Cruz and Hernandez become key suspects even though no physical evidence linked them to the murder and neither had a record of violent crime? Well, Hernandez went to the police with a story he says he made up hoping to get a piece of the $10,000 reward. In one of the stories, he mentioned Cruz, and the police started to question both of them. The police decided Cruz and Hernandez knew too much about the details not to have been involved. Starting out as would-be informants in the investigation, they ended up being tried and convicted for the rape and murder of Janine Nicarico. I did not participate in the break-in, the kidnapping, rape, any of it, murder, none of it, none of it all. Did you see any of it? No. Did you know anything about it? No, nope. not until the police came and talked to me about it. I didn't know nothing at all about it. You made some pretty incriminating statements during the police investigation. Why did you say those things at that time? Nobody took the investigation serious because we're all just a bunch of young, smart-ass street punks. And there wasn't nothing where, okay, this is real serious. We have to be serious about it. We better not lie about it. Nobody paid attention to that, you know? I mean, nobody thought about it that way. If Rolando Cruz is executed, you're convinced that the state would be executing the man who raped and murdered Janine Nicarico? One of them. No doubts whatsoever? No doubts. Three months after the trial that convicted Cruz and Hernandez, another little girl in a neighboring town was also found raped and murdered. This man, Brian Dugan, confessed. This woman saw a connection between Dugan and the Nicarico murder. I began to realize that the things that happened were so similar. 
Eloise Sook, a secretary in the church just up the road from the Nicarico house, contacted the police to tell them she had talked to Brian Dugan the day Janine Nicarico disappeared. I really felt that someone should be aware of the fact that he was in that neighborhood that day. It had been years since you had seen him. How could you remember his face so well? I noticed that one eye was smaller than the other, his left eye. And it stood out in my mind because I remember that I have a daughter that has an eye like that. How significant is it that she talked to Dugan on that day? I believe it's very significant. Eloise Souk puts Brian Dugan about seven-tenths of a mile from the Nicarico home during the time Janine was abducted. Major Ed Sasowski, a former area commander for the Illinois State Police, says he was told by Brian Dugan that he and he alone kidnapped, raped, and killed Janine Nicarico. I was skeptical at first. In all, Dugan was willing to confess to six rapes and three murders on the condition that he be given immunity from the death sentence. In five cases, the authorities agreed, but the prosecutors in the Nicarico case said no. So Sasowski and the state police decided to conduct their own investigation, which included four interviews, a polygraph, and this videotaped confession when Dugan was under hypnosis. You're going to find yourself more and more deeply relaxed. Dugan's confession contained over 50 details that matched the Nicarico kidnapping and assault. He described the inside of the house, accurately remembering the layout and color of several rooms. Although he was wrong on some facts that the prosecution sees as key, Captain Sasowski found his confession remarkably accurate. Grade Brian Dugan's confession on a scale of 1 to 10. The confession? It's a 10. What most impressed Sasowski were facts that Dugan couldn't have made up or changed, like his car. It matched the one seen near the hiking trail down to the missing hubcap. And his work record showed that he had missed work on the very day Janine Nicarico disappeared. He says to you that he didn't show up to work on February 25th, 1983, the day of the murder. That's right. And that is true. That was corroborated by time clock records. He claimed that he kicked the front door in twice? That was corroborated by FBI lab. He gave a fairly accurate, detailed description of the house? He gave a very accurate description of the interior house. Some people might say, there, well, there are a lot of coincidences there. I don't believe in coincidences then. What would you say? I'll say those are facts that can't be disputed. If Brian Dugan had confessed to this crime before Cruz and Hernandez had been convicted, this case would have been one of the easiest murder investigations in DuPage County history. Larry Marshall is Rolando Cruz's lawyer. He says Dugan's confession should have been enough to prove Cruz's innocence. They had everything. They had confessions by Dugan, and what they had, moreover, was Dugan knowing scores and scores of facts that no one could have known about the crime. All of this came forward after a much publicized trial and I, I'm unaware of any details that could not have been gleaned from the publicity concerning the trial and or uh, inside information from the uh, um, from the trial itself. So he could have picked this up in the newspapers or on television? Television, newspapers, in the trial or from some participant. If he fabricated how does, how does he coincidentally miss work the day of the abduction, have a car that matches in make, model, color? He matches the physical description of the individual seen on a prairie pass. His DNA matches. His shoe size matches the footprint on the door. And he's seen in the neighborhood during the time of the abduction. Those are facts that you can't dispute. Tom Knight says that even if Dugan did do it, he thinks Cruz and Hernandez were involved in the murder. What stands out is the fact that they made numerous statements which contained details that only should have been known to those people who were involved. I told them different things. Everything they checked out proved out to be a lie. Everything they checked that I told them proved to be a lie. And they knew it. Records of the case show that for much of the investigation, there were five statements taken from Rolando Cruz, all of them recorded. And in each of these statements, his description of the murder conflicted with the known facts of the case. Then, just four days before trial, the prosecution announced that the police had just remembered a sixth statement by Cruz. 
They said it had been taken 18 months earlier when he was very emotional and crying as he told them about a dream or a vision of the murder. This time, some of the facts did match the murder, but unlike the earlier statements by Cruz, this one was not recorded or even written down. His attorney told me he finds the detective's story hard to believe. Wait a minute. You're telling me that Rolando Cruz, in the biggest case in DuPage County history, finally came into your office, and you're telling me he was emotional, and he was crying, and he was doing what you claim is tantamount to a confession, in terms of his guilty knowledge, and you decided not to make notes, and you decided not to tape it? Ed, that's like my telling you that on the way over to this interview, I walked past a million dollars in a briefcase, and I decided I'd get it on my way back home. Did you ever tell the DuPage County detectives about a vision or a dream you had of, no. of the murder? No, I never told them anything like that. You never told them that? No. Nope. Th there are two detectives who sworn under oath that you did tell them that. Right. But I never told them that. Why would two seasoned police officers lie? I think that the best I can say is that a lot of this investigation and a lot of the misconduct surrounding this investigation was done at a time when they thought they were framing the guilty person. John Sam thinks that's probably true. He was a police detective who worked on the original investigation. We searched and searched through here days and days looking for some type of murder weapon which we never found. Sam quit the force shortly really before Cruz went to trial. He says his partners, who said they took the vision statement, never told him anything about it. You're going to come back and, and not tell your fellow workers that this happened? And you were working closely with these guys? Every day. Every day. I mean, this vision statement would seem to me, if I'm an investigator, as a, I got you. Oh, yeah. I sure would, too. Anything that you would hear about this case would be very important, especially if one of your suspects is making a vision statement. I can't believe for the life of me that that's not important. The fact is that all the circumstances were brought to the attention of the jury when I had the case. Only the jury also had the benefit of hearing the witnesses themselves. I mean, I've tried cases for many, many years, and the one thing it's taught me is the humility to realize that the jurors basically decide cases on facts. In 1988, Rolando Cruz was given a second trial. In his defense, his lawyers wanted Brian Dugan to testify, but Dugan demanded immunity. The judge and the prosecution refused. The judge also ruled the jury could not hear any description of Dugan's five previous sex offenses. Larry Marshall says that information was crucial to prove that Dugan acted alone. This wasn't the case of a burglar. Dugan always acted alone because sex criminals act alone. Dugan was a pedophile who in the past had engaged in this very same kind of crime, including the rape, kidnapping, and murder of an eight-year-old girl. The jury never heard any of that. The jury was never told that Brian Dugan's history was that of a sex offender. There are all types of circumstances where evidence is not allowed to be heard in cases. When Cruz appealed to the state Supreme Court, Roland Burris, the Attorney General of Illinois, oversaw the prosecution. The first prosecutor he assigned, Mary Kinney, resigned after conducting an investigation. She said in her resignation letter, she could not sit idly as this office continues to pursue the unjust prosecution and execution of Rolando Cruz. Burris says it's not her job to decide Cruz's innocence. It's the jury's, and the jury has spoken. They believed, beyond a reasonable doubt, that Rolando Cruz committed this. That is our system, beyond a reasonable doubt. Do whatever you can do before you kill me for something I did not do. Shouldn't you put him on the stand? I mean, if you're going to say Brian Dugan's a liar, put him on the stand and prove he's a liar. The truth has got to surface, and the truth is that Brian Dugan is the sole perpetrator of the abduction, rape, and murder of Janina Caracol.